I'd like to clarify, uh, what I'm giving you here is the tip of the iceberg. Um, I have published over 400 papers, written seven books, writing three more, and um, you've seen some of the documents. Um, so I'm not giving you all the details. Okay, there's a, you're sort of getting hints at uh, things that I have been involved in and uh, various uh, professional activities including various, various international committees or being the president of the uh, Raptor Research Foundation which is a global Raptor research uh, community. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not going into all the details, okay? Uh, this is just an overview and uh, as we say, if you feel like meeting in the future then we can do that again on very specific uh, subjects in which we can go into detail and uh, more, much more information. Uh, the other uh, part is uh, terminology. Um, the word impaling, impaling, skewering, uh, this is the technique that is uh, innate. It is born in the uh, shrikes and something that uh, is also learned. It's 80-20. It is something that at the time nothing was known about. Everyone assumed that shrikes are born with it. But uh, from that point of view, uh, we started a small experiment where I took uh, one nestling from five different um, nests this is still in my master's thesis and um, we were, I was going to raise them at home and to see how they develop into adults and how this specific behavior of impaling develops with them. Okay, um, so much about that because the week after I brought the nestlings home um, Israel invaded uh, South Lebanon. I had to lead my uh, team into beyond uh, beyond enemy lines, 
and I disappeared for six months. And the leak was left, which we, we only had a daughter at the time, and the leak was left to raise the tribe. So she did it for quite a few months, and then they were put in cages at the Desert Research Institute. So that is a part I missed, but what we did get to study, and our daughter was very, she was then, what, five? Uh, was very involved in this, and she would give every nestling a name, and we would have it written down in my field diary. And um, what we were able to discover is that it is a learned through, through playing that the nestlings, when they leave the nest, they essentially pull any object that they catch with their bill until it snags on something, something. And that they develop, that play, they develop into impaling. So if you show me an impaling of a shrike, I can tell you if this is an experienced bird or one that is learning, okay? The one that is learning messes up the process. It's not a clean impaling. A, a, a very experienced bird does it very neatly. I know it sounds very macabre, but it's, it's something that these birds do because they have very weak legs. Unlike raptors, unlike birds of prey, who have very strong legs with which they can kill, these birds, which are passerines, they're songbirds, they have very weak legs. So they use their beak. They have a very strong beak. And I mean, if anyone looks at my knuckles, they're all full of scars. They're from the bites of the shrikes. Okay, whenever I handle shrikes, I come away bloodier than them. Uh, <clears throat> so um, their behavior, is something that is innate, but it has to be learned. It has to be practiced. Okay? And it takes them about six months to learn it properly. I have three questions. Please. Um, is impaling typical only of shrikes? Yes. It's unique to shrikes. Okay. Secondly, when you say a cache, what does it actually mean? A cache is a grouping of several prey items. Okay? <coughs> I mean, you have a cache at home in your kitchen okay. where you put your all treasures, your treasures, basically your treasures. Exactly. Third, what is the size of a shark across mm -hmm. species, across, let's say, family or The size of the cache? Shrike. Oh, um, a great fish shrike weighs, first of all, anybody who has cooked chicken know that they're actually lighter than they look. Okay, because birds have hollow bones. So shrikes are about 60 grams. That is the full length. Okay, but they weigh, the heavier ones will weigh about 60 grams, but they can take prey up to 150 grams, which are three times their own body size. And they actually use impaling to help them in tearing apart the prey item. It's like a butcher's hook. Okay, because otherwise, uh, what a raptor does, it stands on the prey and with its beak, it pulls out the prey. A shrike can't do that, the, the legs are too weak. So it has to impale. So this is a bird that actually uses a tool, okay, to, to access larger prey items. Okay? Uh, did you say just now that the impaling is done the, through the throat? For vertebrates, it's usually in this area. Okay, but then uh, since the grasshoppers have the uh, poison in the... It's not a vertebrate. It's an invertebrate. <coughs> you have to... No, the, the birds, poison, is, poison is here. How does that get... Uh, this, this poison, problem? if I didn't say that when I talked about the lover grasshoppers, what happens is a poison needs to be renewed. Okay? So if the grasshopper does not continue to eat the specific plants from which it can... Uh, extract the, the poisons, the poisons degrade. Okay? So when a shrike impales a grasshopper and the poisons degrade, it changes from red to brown. Got it. And that's when the shrike knows how <coughs> when to eat it. Are shrikes found in India? Oh, yes. That's why India has about 12 species of sort of different shrikes. Yeah. Right? So that's okay. Yeah, yeah. In Marathi, they are called khatik. So you find them everywhere around. So the uh, typical distinctive mark is a black band. Okay. On the, uh, How do you identify them? Actually, we call them 
I even have a paper called Zorro's Mask. Because what I did was epic strikes, and one of the studies was uh, to try and see in which, way, in which way do they orient. And I caught certain strikes and I whited out their masks. And I could see how they did not hunt into the sun because, the, they, because of the glare. You said the, the strikes take the grass off for and put them on that wire threads. Do they come and eat their own one or they the, yes. swipe someone else? They're territorial. <laughs> They're very territorial. Okay? It's like when I look when I look at a, as a behavioral ecologist, when I look at the group, I know who are friends and who are not. Because I can see the what we call the elbow distance between you guys. Okay? So from that point of view, it's, it's territorial behavior, even when you sit here unknowingly, as a, as a group. The chori ne hota us mein. Chori, they don't swipe each other's. Not each other, but there are other kleptoparasites. There are there are uh, kestrels, there are little owls, there are other species that can come and steal, and that is what made it that much more important for me to find out because I was seeing these other species coming in, stealing the, uh, the caches, but the shrike was adamant to come back and impale on the same place. Now why was he wasting so much energy? So just saying he was doing it because he has time to spare is not the answer. And that's how I came to sexual selection. Okay? Right. So now we come back to finish our almost five years of stay in the U.S., Moved from Ohio to Florida. In uh, Florida, in 1993, um, I organized uh, all the strike researchers of the world to come and meet at the Archibald Biological Station. We had the first strike symposium. We created the International Strike Working Group, which continues to function to date. This year, we celebrated 30 years of togetherness. Um, as we said, we were very young when we met. You're all grandfathers now. But it's always yeah, nice to <coughs> include all the young Shrike researchers who come into the picture and join us and continue the tradition. So the Shrikes have become, the Shrikeologists have become a family. Okay? And uh, when I wrote the uh, whole chapter on the, on the, uh, shri on the uh, Handbook of the Birds of the World, I actually enlisted all the Shrike researchers in the world to help me write it. That's why. In the credits, it's written Professor Ruben Yosef and the International Shrike Working. What's the life of a shrike? Um, lifespan in birds in general is a function of body size. Of? The body size. Okay. Uh, the larger the bird, the longer the lifespan, or longevity, as we call it. Um, so from that point of view, the smaller birds are two to three years, those that are five, six grams. Um, the larger birds can be anywhere up to 60 to 80 years. There are only two groups which are exceptions to the rules. Those are parrots and owls. They live exceptionally long uh, as compared to their body mass. Okay? Physiologically. Um, right. Any more <coughs> questions? Which is the yes, bird, which is the bird yes, that... Just a second. I have heard birds where I live. And uh, I never find a dead bird in my garden. Very, very rarely. It's, it's, it's organic material. It's very immediately dead, recycled. Dead it's, look, anything dead is immediately eaten up by somebody else. It's, it's organic recycling. Okay? That's why you'll never find a dead bird, a dead butterfly, any dead animal as such in the wild. Because there's always a scavenger who will prey upon it. Only dead bird I find is a crow. <laughs> I don't know nobody eats it. I, I, it's, it's because they're more in the human uh, habitat. habitat and there are less scavengers. They themselves are scavengers. They themselves are scavengers. Exactly. Okay? Uh, I was saying, uh, there's a bird which, uh, be when it becomes old, it, it regoes its own claws by hitting something and you know. Which is See, we call that senescence. But senescence is getting old. Uh -huh. Okay, we are all in the stage of advanced senescence. <laughs> uh, so, um, no, a usually, see, in the wild, the old and the unfit, sick, are usually 
out of the game by predation. Okay, predation is a very, very important part of controlling the environment. We have artificially disengaged from it by building walls and wearing clothes. Okay, but in the wild, predation is meant to remove all the unfit individuals from the game. Okay, so there is no such thing as old animals. They are preyed upon almost immediately by the younger ones, by the fitter ones. Okay, fitter from the point of view, or physically fit, not reproductively. Right. Um, yes, I'm saying some things which may not sound nice to the ear of some people. Uh, but, okay, so we came back to Elat uh, in Israel. I was offered the position of uh, establishing a bird sanctuary. And I must here thank uh, Mrs. Simon Kurikir Roster. And um, last year, I was, uh, because of that project, I was also awarded the Kiroskar Vasundara Award. <coughs> and uh, <laughs> um, so in Eilat, um, so the question is why Eilat? In Eilat, for those of you who don't know, this is Israel, the Dead Sea, the Gaza Strip, Sinai. Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. Okay, the Mediterranean Sea. This is the Red Sea, which goes down to the Indian Ocean. So we are the eastern arm of the Red Sea, which comes up from the Indian Ocean. The western arm becomes the Suez Canal, goes to the Mediterranean, and we sit at the top of the eastern arm. Across from us is Aqaba. If anybody has seen Lawrence of Arabia, captures a Aqaba from the uh, Sorry, the school days. Okay, so that's across the straits from us. Um, but what happens here? That slide, please. Okay. This usually <clears throat> takes me four whole lessons of four hours each to teach at my course in oncology. I try to do it in ten minutes. Um, <clears throat> bird migrations. Now I know this is egocentric or geocentric. In that we are looking only at Europe and uh, Africa, but we have to take into account that Europe is a big landmass that merges with Asia and, of course, India uh, to the south, with the, uh, with the uh, Southeast Asia over there. But essentially, <coughs> one has to realize that birds are responding to a cue, one cue in the environment, and that is the shortening of the day length, what we call the photo period. When the day length starts to shorten, that is the cue for the birds that the time will come when there will not be enough food and the ambient temperature will be too low to continue to survive. Physiologically, birds have a higher body temperature than us. They are at 42 degrees while we are at 38. Right, Doctor? Uh, so, from that point of view, they have to have extremely high resources to be able to survive in the wild. So there are two options to survive. Sorry, there are three options. One is to release eggs and die. And those eggs will then hatch next season. The second option is hibernation, which is going to winter sleep. The third option is to migrate. Now, birds that have wings and are able to fly distances have taken the third option. They migrate. And their migration away from the approaching winter to the approaching summer is annual. Because here, when it becomes summer, there are enough resources to be able to breed and put forward almost five times your population. There is enough food. But you have to realize that when the daylight shortens here, it increases here, it lengthens here. And when it shortens here, they respond to that and go back. Now there are three kinds of habitats which birds would rather not cross. <coughs> Big bodies of water, 
deserts and mountains, high mountains. Okay, there are always exceptions to the rules. I'm talking about the majority. <clears throat> so I'm saying that because one of our big problems is what we what we professionals call armchair ecologists. Those who watch only National Geographic and Discovery Channel. Okay? Because they're they're journalists. They're professionals, but they're journalists. And they're looking for the sensations. They're looking for the exceptions to the rule. So although their, uh, their films are excellent, most of them are the exceptions to the rule. Because what is ruled is mundane, it's not interesting. Okay, so you have to realize that what we're looking at is selective. <clears throat> now, when you look at what's happening from Europe, these birds are coming down. The first thing they hit is the Mediterranean. Then the Sahara Desert. And then they come down into Central Africa. I won't go into the physiology. As I said, it takes only six, almost 16 hours to explain this map to my students. But I'll go a little into the physiology of the birds. <coughs> <coughs> Two minutes. Um, birds have a capacity which our doctors are today studying to prevent obesity. Because birds can atrophy internal organs as per their will. Birds have the ability to atrophy 18 different organs and convert that tissue into fat for migration, the fuel for migration. Okay, so for example, I finish my reproductive season in, in Europe and I need to make this migration here but 25% of my body mass is my gonads. I don't need this in Africa. I don't breed in Africa. I'm going to carry 25% of my body mass to Africa? I convert it into fat. So if you do a laparoscopy, like we have done sometimes, you open here for a bird, the whole genital, the whole the gonads are a simple, very, very fine white tube. That's all that remains. Nothing. That whole thing is converted into fat. The other big, very heavy uh, system that we have is our digestive system. Okay? So most of that is atrophied into fat. <coughs> so when a bird is on migration, it's essentially doing it on, while fasting. It cannot feed simply because it has no intestines to assimilate the food. Okay? And that is the importance of staging areas. Areas where at the extreme of their migration, the birds have to stop and refuel. And that's what I'm heading for in Ela. Because when they go south, and by the way, most of the bird species that are on migration, on one fuel, on one tank, can do about 3,000 kilometers. <laughs> okay? 1,000 kilometers every 24 hours. I won't see any aircraft or any car doing that. Their fuel efficiency is incredible. A gram of fat is about 1,000 kilometers. Okay? So, and I'm talking of birds which are 5 or 6 grams, which is, of who doesn't, anybody who doesn't know, when you look at a sachet, sachet a packet of sugar, you'll see it's written 5 grams. Okay, and it's one of those wonders that I ringed on 24th of March uh, 2004. A, a lesser white throat in Ela. That's a lesser white throat. Weighed five and a half grams. 36 hours later, that bird was reported in Wales. Okay, that's, that's their capability. These are the wonders of nature. Now, when you, when you experience this, I mean, you cannot but just say, wow, okay? And so these birds going south don't really experience a real challenge because this is 3,000 kilometers. Now, what happens in Africa is this is the Sahil, semi-arid. This is the rainy season here. 
in our order. So when these birds go through, this is all they have to pass. The problem is that as the winter advances and the rain stops, all this adds on to the Sahara. All these winter birds are coming down here. Now it's the summer here. The breeding birds of Africa, the local birds of Africa are breeding. That is, Africa has to supply food not only to the hundreds of new mouths that are being born in Africa, but also to the millions who have come from Europe. So the competition for food is at an extreme. And actually, the way I, the way I tell my students is if you put up your fingers, and when five individuals from a population go, go down south, only two will return. That's 60%. 60% have become somebody else's food in Africa. Okay? So, now the question is, what happens when the daylight starts dropping? The birds are concentrated here because of the geophysical condition. This is a tropical rainforest. So these birds are in eastern and southern Africa. So when it becomes autumn there and they have to go back to the spring in the wintering ground and their breeding grounds, they are funneled along the eastern flyway. When they have come down on the western from Gibraltar to Italy, Sicily, Tunis, and across, or come through the Middle East. Doesn't matter. They are concentrated in the spring on the eastern flyway. The point is, when they leave the Ethiopian highlands, their 3,000 kilometers ends in Iran. And for millions of years, Eilat has been the staging area. Eilat has been the place where many of these populations reach at the extremities of their physiological capabilities to continue the migration. Like you said Ilak, is it? Ilak. Ilak. That's how we say it in Hebrew. It's just some that write it with an I, some that write it without the I. Okay? So, Ilak, as you can see it, the aerial photograph, and by the way, that's where in Ilak they stop, they regrow their digestive tract, which takes three to four days. So they have to reach not only at the excess, at the extremes of their capabilities, they have to reach with enough resources on them to be able to regrow the digestive tract so they can then start feeding. It's a challenge. Okay? Now, when they reach Eilat, um, we used to collect all these, what I, I call them the walking dead. Because a lot of the citizens, out of pity, pick up these birds which are just standing there and not doing anything. And it doesn't matter what you do. You can add sugar water, you can give them water, you can do anything, they won't survive. Because they, they have reached this point with not enough to assimilate the digestive tract. They are part of what we call the statistics. Okay? So, it, I know it's a sad thing, but that's nature. <clears throat> and, Eilat, this, by the way, in 1980, the same year that Lawrence captured Akba. Okay? On the other side, what you can see is a salt marsh. The shrine. And it came into existence because the Dead Sea, like a, you see, it's a small arm. And it's quite shallow at the beginning. So whenever there is a south storm, it brings up a lot of the detritus and dumps it on the shore. So that shoreline is about three meters higher than the hinter. So all the floods coming from the mountains accumulated here. And what came into existence was a salt marsh with a very specific plant, Sueda monoica. Now the Sueda, in order to get away from the extremes of the desert, Fruits and flowers twice a year, in autumn and spring. Now you're starting to get the picture. Is that this is the species that was the key 
to the migration of these species. This was the habitat where it existed in very dense, what you can see. Okay, this is a picture taken by a German photographer, pilot, uh, came down in a Fokker, we are talking about World War I, uh, they were stationed uh, in uh, Amman, and he flew down to a Dakaba and took the picture to the west. Next slide please. This is the picture in 1956, 1948, Iraq was taken by Israel, became Israel's port on the Red Sea, and what you can see is how that little piece of salt marsh, this was also part of that salt marsh, this tunnel, is already being developed. <coughs> um, by the way, I'm not one of those who is much like these uh, uh, nice words that we make up to disillusion ourselves. I usually say destroy, but we like to say that. Um, so, this has become a huge shopping mall. The airport, the first of the um, salt pans to for the salt industry, and there is a hotel over here. And they started this rubbish tip at the northern. This north is that way. So the birds are coming from here. This rubbish tip over here, the municipal rubbish tip, which becomes significant in my story later. And north is here. Now this way. This is the picture in the 19 when I came to Israel. Yeah. I have two questions, if you don't mind. Pardon me? I have two questions. Please. Firstly, the birds have developed rather, they uh, say evolved from the reptiles. The uh, original uh, reptilia, class reptilia, modified itself into eggs, birds. An example of the typical example of chicken, which has got a very strong leg and it has got teeth in its beak. So these are the proof. The birds have evolved from the Repeats and they are still over balanced. Second question in, in that category is the birds fly or migrate because of some magnetic effect of the earth. They find direction of places, every year they come to the same place because of magnetic effect, not because of anything else. This is what we learned in school and colleges. Could you please tell us how they have developed? Uh, Repelia is a very heavy bone, heavy bone animal, mm. and uh, birds are very yeah. bone. Okay, you will excuse me if I don't address the first question. Okay. Um, since, um, so, no, just talking about how birds develop from dinosaurs, I'm capable of doing it, or from the theropods, but uh, this is not a talk on dinosaurs. Okay. okay. But I do tell my students that the last of the dinosaurs that survived the cat cataclysmic uh, event are today called birds. birds. So I'm actually a dinosaur researcher. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I can talk to you about the evolution of the feather, of the claws, of the beak, everything else, about the hot bloodedness, thermoregulation, but that's not the topic of this talk. So you will excuse okay. me if I don't address Sorry. that. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing about migration is also another topic by itself. Yes. How do birds migrate? Okay. And some of the ideas we know that they have 18 different strategies of migration. There's a German couple, Wilsko and Wilsko, who in pigeons, carrier pigeons, have employed different systems to try and black out different characteristics around the brain and the head, and the birds still got there. Okay, so we know, we know that they have a very, very transparent skull. They're able to see through it. They can read light. You can close their eyes and they can still see light and the, uh, uh, the various types of light through that skull. Okay, magnetism. There's a lot of things going on which uh, the Earth's uh, gravitational forces. There's a lot of things going on, but once again, that's a whole topic in itself. Okay, um, so Elad, as you can see, what is left or what is not left of that salt marsh is nothing. Literally nothing, but what we have is the hotel industry, the salt ponds, agriculture of the kibbutz, and the garbage dump, which have in the meantime reached large proportions. So I was then asked in 93 in order to come back to, this was the project offered to me 
was come back and do something with this corpus. That is the Elat Bird Sanctuary, which some of you here have visited. Suman, Anand, Swapnil. Okay, so <clears throat> these, this is a project that um, became globally important. You can understand why. Because during the years of this beaver, the development, essentially bird populations are suffering. And Europe identified, Edgar, the European Union put a finger on the topic and said, Elak. Elak is the problem. That's where our, many of our bird populations are being hammered. Okay, slide please. Um, so what I started was essentially redeveloping that area. Was converting it from a garbage dump into an eco-friendly habitat, which we call the bird sanctuary, and um, creating it in become making it into a, a bird friendly habitat, but not where we put out feeders for the birds, but that they have to collect the food naturally. Next slide, please. And uh, using different indigenous species, I essentially planted huge plots, landscaped everything according to my own experience and knowledge, uh, and put out big plots of plants that would fruit and flower during the migration seasons and that would supply energy to the migratory populations. So this is an example of two species which are extremely sugar rich and which can help bird species to replenish their uh, stores quickly and continue in the migration to Europe and Asia. Next slide please. Oh. And so this is how the birds actually look back in, I think it was, this is 86 or 88. Um, we have a natural lake. Um, in order to prevent the um, <clears throat> flow of uh, sewage into the sea, into the Red Sea, which was creating problems with the coral reefs, uh, we had all that go through the bird sanctuary. So all the plants were getting vast amounts of organic material. They were growing nicely. You know, we had much more fruiting and flowering than would naturally happen in the desert. Because you have to remember, I have only 9% of the area of what was the original soil. So in 9%, I have to give 100% of the answer. And the answer was the bird sanctuary. So I used every possible, wherever in the city they were developing new hotels, new neighborhoods, I had all the trucks diverted to my bird sanctuary to dump all that earth, so as to cover, to compact the earth, to cover it up, and to landscape it according to my requirements. <coughs> Then to have it planted as per the bird's requirements. Slide, please. Hi. And um, I had many, I had almost 160 uh, PhD postdoc students go through my place in 17 years that I ran the project. And um, <clears throat> of course, conservation is very much related. And once again, as I told you, meetings, talks led to a lot of different uh, research projects around the world. Uh, education of high school students uh, from kindergarten on would come to visit and receive a lecture from us. I will ask you a question here. How did you get this fresh water uh, in desert? Desalination plant. Just yeah. above me is the desalination plant and all their uh, excess water was funneled into my bird sanctuary. I'm, I'm good at having chai with pro the, pro the, the, the relevant people. <laughs> no, I mean, I in Israel, it's coffee. I went to Barber where trying this project. This okay. Um, slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so, we re recycled the local uh, garbage tip into a bird sanctuary. Um, here you can see, have an impression of a flock of white winged black terns, of uh, how the skies become black with birds, mm -hmm. with millions flying overhead at once. You know, mostly in April, this is all honey buzzards. We are talking of birds that are about two and a half meters wingspan. Okay, so this is not just a single second shot. This can stream for days during the migration season. Uh, books that we have written on the subjects are, keep going, uh, different uh, 40 years of raptor migration study, raptor in hand identification. I did a lot of raptor trapping 
I would trap hundreds of raptors during the season and uh, uh, all that information we put into a book. Uh, same thing over here, conferences, um, we con con concentrated on species of a specific concern like the Levant Sparrowhawk because uh, one of the things that I discovered was that the species was disadvantaged by the then Chernobyl incident. Okay, this became a bioindicator for what was happening to the grounds to the east of Chernobyl. Um, <clears throat> Step eagles led me to research in Mongolia because I wanted to know their species also that was uh, strongly affected by uh, Chernobyl. Slide please, you can see some of the papers. I mean, you can see that there are several hundred papers published on the subjects. Um, this is in Mongolia, the link with one of the upland buzzards, uh, where I, um, the first ornithologist was my PhD student. He worked on Sake of Falcons and then I worked with him on, he came to Israel for a year's postdoc. Uh, Gambo, Gambo Bata, Sundev, with his daughter Mara, who is now uh, finished and she's a doctor, <coughs> medical doctor. And that's us, that's how we live in the field, since there is only one city in all of Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, and the rest of it is just steppes or desert mountains. So all you do is you drive with a GPS and eventually you just stop. Um, <clears throat> and you camp where you are. Um, so that was a lot, a lot to tell about Mongolia. It was a wonderful experience. We worked there for five years. Uh, different topics. Gombo is now a professor in his own state. And um, this is at our uh, station in a lot. Uh, typical morning. This is one of my uh, colleagues from Italy who worked with me, Professor Lorenzo Fornasari. That's me holding a Bonelli's eagle, uh, a Georgian eagle. That's a uh, uh, short toed uh, short toed buzzard, a common uh, uh, sparrowhawk, and a Levant sparrowhawk. That's our son Harris, who would work with me a lot in the field. He became a wonderful uh, uh, raptor biologist. Although a squadron leader in the Air Force today. But, slide please. <clears throat> we even wrote a story about him. Children's uh, story about how Ayers takes care of a buzzard and releases it to the wild. It's also on YouTube. Sorry, it's in Hebrew. But it's a story for children, for uh, uh, primary school children, uh, describing migration and the hardships of migration. So bringing it through Ayers as a story, and we actually um, prepared it. Uh, and the authors are Nufar, our daughter, and Dalit. I'm only the scientific advisor. But uh, <clears throat> um, we prepared it for the day that Eris got his pips. So he got it as his, uh, as his first day as an officer. He got it as a present from the family. <clears throat> um, slide, please. Um, South Africa, so essentially an Ares, as you can see, uh, would go with me all over the place. And uh, as I said, he has a wonderful eye for raptors. Uh, when I went to South Africa for the first time, um, I was asked to give a series of lectures. And um, Ares sort of said, Dad, don't you need a secretary? And I said, OK, join. <laughs> we were lucky he did. Because, I mean, the year he is with the lion cub, we then had Chita. This is us in Peru National Park. Slide, please. And then we came to a rehabilitation center near Johannesburg. And uh, my friend, Professor Gerard Ferdun, and myself, we sort of saw this booted eagle on the grass, tethered over there in rehabilitation, and we kept walking. <coughs> Harris stays behind, keeps looking at the eagle, and um, he wouldn't leave. Eventually, Gerard and I went back to him and said, hey, what's the problem? He said, Dad, this is not the booted eagle we catch in Eilat. This is something else. It's too small. So we picked up the eagle, measured it, and it really did not fit the measurements that we have in Eilat. So we went into it further, and lo and behold, we had discovered what the South Africans had lived with and didn't know. They had their own subspecies of booted eagle, which they assumed were European, because the European booted eagles come and live winter in Africa. 
but they had not realized <coughs> that they had their own subspecies of booted eagle which was local, which was breeding in South Africa. So we did a lot of different studies. The next year at the International Raptor Conference, um, that's my colleague, Professor Sharad Cardoon, and uh, <coughs> who's also a colonel in the South African Special Forces. Um, and we essentially published this paper, and we also gave it as a talk, with Herard holding that type specimen on his arm, and I took Erez onto the podium with me saying, look how a nine-year-old can contribute to science. So from that point of view, this is our contribute, his contribution to science by identifying something that we were in the rut would not have paid enough attention to. Um, I'm a, by the way, I'm, all, I'm also a professor at several universities. I haven't bothered with that. Uh, whether it's the University of Milano, Mikoka University, or uh, University of Idaho in the, the, uh, Boise, Idaho, uh, US, uh, University of Amsterdam in Holland, but um, the strike group that I mentioned, International Strike Working Group. So we've become a family, and I showed you prefer previously Professor Lorenzo Fortasari um, holding an eagle with me in a lab. He came with his students for many years to work and get their PhDs, Christine and his wife, and all psychologists here working. So we, so we essentially really became a working group that lived each other's families. So strikes became, the different strike species, became an integral part of our research, studying all different uh, subjects around the world. Okay? Slide, please. This is what I told you about the mask of Zorro. The study wherein we essentially took groups of strikes, whited out their masks, and studied what would happen. It's very much like why we wear sunglasses so we can look into the sun, okay? And that's the same principle, or why American football players put black markings under their eyes so that they, they're not, the glare doesn't bother them in the eye, and we found that essentially by manipulating their masks. This is called the mask strike. Um, in India also, I think. Yeah. And um, essentially, you could see their hunting capability because when they have the mask, they hunt into the sun. The advantage being their shadow is behind them. When they don't have the mask, they're forced to hunt with the back to the sun. And their shadow reaches the predator, the prey, before they do. So the prey has a much better chance of escaping. <coughs> okay? So in this way, we essentially prove that the mask of Zorro, and I did this with two of my postdocs today, <coughs> both professors themselves, from uh, Piotr Zduniak and Piotr Tijanowski in the University of Poland. And, um, <coughs> slide please. Um, worked on strikes almost all over the world. You can see in South Africa, in Hungary, um, this was in uh, Taiwan, and in Taiwan I had a very interesting uh, situation when I was there at the International Raptor Conference. Was the lady who was also a strike researcher, and she was organizing the conference, told me, Ruben, there are these two guys, I cannot understand their English, they're Indians. <laughs> Can you please translate? <laughs> I said, sure, bring them over. And uh, so she brought me these two Indians, and we started talking. I mean, for them, I'm a professor <laughs> from Israel, so spoke with me in English. And then uh, after talking about for about half an hour and helping her and translating all the technology, um, I then sort of asked them, "Where do you come from?" And they say, "Oh, we are from Maharashtra." <laughs> I said, "Wonderful, but where in Maharashtra?" He said, "We are from Pune." So I went into Marathi, <laughs> and you can understand you can under, you can understand how their faces look <laughs> when suddenly an Israeli goes into Marathi, and um, to me, So 
So I explained to them that I was also born and grew up in Pune, and I'm no less a Punekar than they are. And uh, that was Dr. Anil Mahabal of the Forest Department. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Satish Pandey. I'd invited him, they couldn't come, but uh, with Satish later, we developed in Pune the Ella Foundation, uh, which is an uh, NGO. It does a lot of wonderful work. I'll show that later. Slide, please. Um, things also diversified because of unexpected incidents. I had this postdoc, Michał Wojciechowski, from Poland, uh, who, along with my master's professor, Professor Barry Pincher, that's South African, that we became friends and we had postdocs together. Okay, slide, please that what we were doing was we were evaluating with the help of, uh, you would know that stay, um, with that machine, uh, where doctors used to evaluate osteoporosis in uh, people. Okay, so we used that machine, DEXA machine, to evaluate the fat component of the birds. Okay, so this is how a DEXA machine tells me exactly, I of course isolate the ring, so that the metal doesn't come to the picture. But I can isolate how much of it is bone, how much of it is muscle, how much of it is fat. So I can know how ready the birds are. I can essentially graph them. That if I get a, get a bird in the hand, I bring it, I know it is 13 grams. Where on the scale for that species that 13 grams sits? Is it in, in its uh, position where it will not survive or, would not yet, or it will survive? At what stage do they leave me after staging in Ayla? So all these ecological questions, we were answering with this. And what we did, see after three minutes, you can see the kind of readout, the lean mass, the fat mass, the total. I can get the fun complete readout on the bird. Okay, it's like a mini X-ray. Uh, <clears throat> so we fitted a lot of these birds with uh, transplants so that we could follow them and see how they were recuperating at the bird sanctuary. Until, and we put them in enclosures, giving them a lot of watermelon so that they could feed on the sugars, and to see how they were recovering their body mass. And every day we would come in, and with our little uh, antenna, verify that each of the birds was present, that the antenna, that the, uh, um, <clears throat> and we had implanted these antenna, these uh, transmitters in the stomach, we made a small, small slit, <coughs> stick the transmitter in, weigh several, uh, three grams, cover it up and use glue, super glue to close the slit. Uh, don't adopt that <laughs> as a technique. Not, <laughs> it works on birds. Uh, and uh, essentially we could then get different readouts, heartbeat, body, uh, uh, blood pressure, uh, location, okay, there are different physiological readouts from these transmitters. And one of the uh, things that happened to us was suddenly one of the birds, instead of being at 42 degrees centigrade, was reading 17 degrees centigrade. And we couldn't figure out what happened. A bird can't survive at 17 degrees. We know that birds can go into torpor in order to save energy. Okay, that during the daytime when they collect their food, they're collecting energy. At night, they continue to waste the same amount of energy. So how do they reduce that uptake? They, re they go into torpor, into deep sleep, okay? And then we found a carpet fiber and swallowed one of my birds. Okay, it's in here. So we caught the carpet fiber, kept it in a bucket for almost over a week until it spat out the bird with the transmitter. It was still working. Okay, that's my black throat. Uh, so, sorry, black cat. That's how it looks after it's been digested by a white one. But the transmitter is still transmitting. <laughs> okay, so suddenly we start saying, hey, something's happening with vipers. I told you, the holistic approach. Look at the big thing. So, we started studying the vipers. And by the way, I have a whole paper on individual identity in vipers. But we found that each of the heads has a different pattern. Okay? So that's, that's a different subject again. But that's when we started studying vipers. 
Like, please? Keep going. Okay. Here's the head patterns. You can see how they look in the field. They're very different. And then we started finding out that these vipers are targeting the lesser, the less fit birds. So we, what we did was kept birds of the same species in four different cages. Those just of migration, extremely light, having recuperated for two days, almost ready to go, and those almost left. And we released the viper in the middle. Where would, who would it go for? Left. They go to the, the least fit for migration. Because those are the ones that go into the deepest torpor. And when they go into torpor, they also neutralize vigilance. So a viper can come up to them, make as much noise as it wants, and the bird is not aware of its approach. And that's why it was targeting them much more. So here's how science rolls one into the other. And we have a whole series of paper on the vipers now. I never thought I would be studying vipers, but there it is. Slide, please. Um, so that's my bird sanctuary. That's the international border with Jordan. And when Israel signed the peace treaty with uh, Jordan, the uh, governor of uh, Aqaba approached me and said, look, I have received from the Americans a wonderful sewage treatment plant. So now I have all these sewage ponds. I don't know what to do with them. Would you help me? And so that's the governor of Aqaba and myself, with his secretary, signing an agreement, a peace treaty, personal peace treaty between Iraq and Aqaba, wherein I developed a bird sanctuary across the international border in Aqaba. <laughs> okay? So I've duplicated that into Aqaba, increasing the chances for the birds to survive. <clears throat> and that's the visitor center in Aqaba with the, the name. Uh, CEO of the Jordanian Wildlife Conservation uh, Organization. Slide, please. Um, I also built a bird sanctuary in South Korea. Uh, they asked for the same thing. And uh, <clears throat> slide, please. Um, I had also some very interesting uh, uh, work with in Operation Wallacea. They asked me to volunteer my summers for um, educating international students who is specifically targeted um, biology and wildlife uh, ecology. And since I'm a hands-on, as you can see, um, what I did was one summer I volunteered in Peru on the Amazon. And we went there and lived on the boats for six weeks. These are the rubber boats, slide please. Um, that's me uh, setting up with the locals in the jungles, miss nets to study the local birds. Slide. Um, students around me, students doing their master's, PhD, whatever. Uh, slide please. Um, some of the Amazon birds. Some of you put this up on the, on our WhatsApp group, and I sent you this picture of the royal flycatchers. Okay, the mot mot. And it was a very interesting experience working in the rainforest, and of course working in education, teaching them survival techniques, uh, such and such things. Okay, slide. That's me coming back from every day, afternoon, the rain, you know, the clouds just <coughs> accumulate and heavy rain, rainforest. So living on the Amazon, that's me coming back from field work. There was no point in putting on a raincoat or holding an umbrella. I mean, whatever you did, you got wet. So we just enjoyed the rain. <coughs> And of course, the students had a gala time playing mud football. Um, that's how every afternoon this would terminate the PhD students against the master's students. <coughs> like this. Our food was mostly, um, the, the carbs were brought with us on the boat, but the, um, <coughs> the rest we had to catch for ourselves. So the best catch were the piranhas. And uh, that's what we ate a lot. It's like this. Those are the red, red piranhas. Um, they're fun catching. Uh, they're very tasty, by the way. Um, <laughs> slide, please. Um, the year after that, I was asked to go to move from the rainforest to the cloud forest. 
in Honduras. And uh, so I worked for six weeks in Honduras with uh, local students and foreign students from Singapore. Uh, the UK, this is a class of uh, high school students from the UK uh, who came to see the place. Right? Uh, for me, very interesting was two PhD students from the University of Cork, Ireland, uh, who did a PhD on what happens in the canopies of the cloud forest. Who lives there? No one's ever studied this. So we would climb up into the canopies for a week. That's us, that's me over here, that's the two of them. And you would live up in the canopies of 40 to 60 meters above ground for up to a week. Everything there, you tie your sleeping bag around the tree, all the, all the branches are like, you know, like a highway. You just walk between the trees and walk kilometers that way. And um, you do everything from up there. It's like this. Um, the animals you can see living up to 40 to 60 feet, uh, 60 meters above ground, they never see or feel ground under them. They live up there. Okay? They have no phase of life where they are on the ground. We use uh, various drones <coughs> to collect insects at those heights because once again a lot of information on this is lacking. Um, some of the species up there. Right. So, and then uh, since I met uh, Dr. Satish Pandey in, uh, in Taiwan and he invited me to come to India and uh, help um, convince him to establish the ELA Foundation in Pune. Um, in Pingori, they bought some land and here you can see me demonstrate um, how to catch birds, what to do with them, what are the techniques, um, sort of uh, creating a cadre of uh, local uh, students who would work in this field over here explaining to them, you are planting a tree, it's a, it's a huge tree now, slide please, that's the tree today. Um, <clears throat> as it looks in Pingori, I very much recommend people to go and visit there. It's also become a very big medical uh, center for all the villages uh, that Satish and his team volunteer their time and expertise, giving them all the medical help that uh, they can. And at the same time, sort of educating the villages in conservation uh, subjects. Um, at an OWN conference in the Netherlands, I then met uh, Mr. Praveen Charde, who is the principal of the uh, Mahila Sevadal Mahila Mahavidyalay in Nagpur. And he roped me in because of a certain project that they are involved in. It turns out that that college was targeted by the government of India to help the disadvantaged women from villages. We all know that the fate of many of these women is very uncertain once they get married. So the government of India started a project where they would remove these women quietly with their children from the villages and they would disappear. They would disappear to this college and they would get integrated into the student body. So Dalit and myself, Dalit got involved with the uh, primary school and the teachers and I got involved. I wrote a whole doctoral program for them of how these women can then become, get their masters, get their doctorates and be trained to live lives like we do. Not just life in rural areas. So we worked over the nine years there and one of my students, this is Rucha who was one of the ladies who worked on quail. This is Reddy. He was the chief forest officer for um, the Tadoba area. He did his PhD with me on tigers. And um, we worked on the subject in, this is with the forest department in Nakpo. So we worked on tigers and how we can, and Bohr was just declared as the latest tiger reserve in Nakpo area. Okay, so we had a lot of work to do there from the ecotourism point of view, trying to find a solution between the uh, people around Bohr and the tigers themselves. Um, and then we came, I came for a raptor conference in, um, yeah, I uh, came for a raptor conference in Pune and uh, a gentleman walks up to me and says, look, there is this wonderful leopard reserve in uh, 
Jaipur in Jalana, and I'd like you to help me study them. And so that's Swapnil Dev, who's now my PhD student for the last six years, and we are working on the leopards in Jaipur. And I'd like to sort of finish with a short story. Please go on, that's it, with the local volunteers. The Jalana Forest Reserve is where we are working. My time is up, that's why I'm going to be very quick about this, but it's important for me to give you the message that all of these species give us what are called ecosystem services. That they help us survive and have a standard of living which we otherwise would not have. And people consider these large predators as dangerous. But do you realize how important they are to our health and happiness? Well, the leopards in Jaipur are an example. Not only have they so in Jalana is now completely uh, encompassed by the city of Jaipur and the villages around it. It's like it had become a, what we call a heat island because all our buildings create heat, generate heat, it's like, and we have a slide. Like, and we published a paper on how Jalana essentially moderates the temperatures of Jaipur, which is a semi-desert city, by almost 15 degrees centigrade in the summer. Okay, slide, we keep going. Yeah. Okay, keep going. Um, coexistence, <laughs> right, keep going. Going. Keep going. <laughs> right. We've also done, by camera trapping and other techniques, we have also uh, mapped the needs of the leopards in the forest, within the city. And one of the things that came on uh, we have all their genealogy, okay, for the last uh, so many years, and this was last year, so we just shared. I was at a conference giving the talk, and he sent me the picture of uh, Flora turning up with the two new cubs. So I immediately put that into my talk. Next slide, please. We've done various uh, papers on how electric vehicles can use can be used instead of the petrol or diesel uh, jeeps for safaris. Okay, this is the one I want to come to. Um, analyzing the prey of the leopards in Jalana, what stood out was that the street dogs were the major prey item that they were taking. They were coming into the city and they were taking dogs. Now this may seem horrific. By the way, in the Times of India today, uh, which I received in the hotel, it says that Pune has about 1.7 million street dogs. Okay? You'll see why it's important. So we found that street dogs were an important part. Okay, we have a chapter coming out in the Springer book right now, and you can see that India certainly suffers from street dog and rabies problem, and of course, disfiguration that you're going to get. And this is law, so you have to add a zero. Okay, and what you can see is that the major cosmopolitan cities of India, the number of dog-related incidents as compared to Jaipur. See how low it is. We're talking about 100 and something dog bites a year as compared to almost 100,000 in Varanasi. Okay? This difference slightly, is thanks to the leopards. The citizens of Jaipur enjoy less dog bites, less rabies, less disfigurements, and less death, a better standard of living, thanks to the leopards. This is an ecosystem service that the Jaipuris would never realize that they were being given by this khatarmak animal living in their midst. <laughs> okay? It's like this. And you can see the dogs keep going. Okay. Uh, another service, we know that vultures in India have disappeared thanks to the veterinary medicine called Diclofenac. And 95-99% uh, of the vultures have gone extinct. And so India has a huge health problem. Scavenger. Public health. No scavengers. Of carcasses in the field. It turns out that who are stepped in are the vultures. They are the ones who are now removing carcasses that otherwise the vultures would have done. Like okay. I do a lot of research with high school students now. I won't go into that, but you can see I bring a lot of the children into the field. They work with me for a year, and they present projects. 
for their high school certificate and I also bring them to the point where they not only work for the high school certificate but also, but they also publish scientific papers with me. Slide please. Okay, keep going. Um, bringing teams together, this is working with the 21 years now working with the Greeks in uh, Saloniki with the, on the lesser cash flow uh, populations. My high school students, I go with them to Greece, take them from Israel in order to do research and we show them that biology is a worldwide thing. It's not limited. It has no geographical limits. A national. Right. Keep going. Um, keep going. I'm also working on Red Sea ghost crabs, which are an indigenous species endangered. Keep going. In Elak, these all things from Elak. And um, keep going. No, you have to go past them. I won't talk about the Red Sea ghost. As you can see, there's a lot to talk about. But since I've been already told to shut up, so uh, it's uh, going to be. I keep going. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I'm working on nest box colonies in many of uh, many cities in Greece, in Cyprus, in Israel. Thank you. Keep going. And on working on the master cures, working on other uh, different awards that I have received through the years. Um, as I said, keep going. Keep going. Okay, and the latest, as I mentioned earlier, ah, where, keep going. Okay, I was also awarded the National Geographic Education Award. Um, the Bharat Ratna, I got the Israeli Ratna from the President of Israel, Mr. Um, Shimon Peres. Let's have lunch with him. Slide, please. Keep going. This is I'm working on archaeological things to prove what were used by. Again, it's uh, by gladiators and things. But this is the fun, the four grandsons now. <laughs> so that is uh, to say fitness and thank you. Slide. Excellent. Okay, um, nice slide. slide. Right. Thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you. 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 Thank life experiences and achievements. We are very thankful to you, Professor Mohan. And I hope all of you enjoyed this talk. Yes. Thank you. We'll ask we'll talk Just after. one small. We'll talk afterwards. Over lunch. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come, Ruben. Let's sit here. Ruben, come and sit here.